Newport, Rhode Island, is a jewel of a city that sits on the shores of the Atlantic Ocean. This city has played host to some of the wealthiest Americans during the summers of the Gilded Age and has had a fascinating history that is intriguing and surprising. It is one of the first cities in America to open its arms to people of different cultures and religions and was at one time, a very big part of the heart of the New England economy. In this episode of the fascinating stories and history of our neighborhoods, we will look at Newport, Rhode Island's very interesting history and see how this city flourished from its humble beginnings to become the playground of the very wealthy. But before we begin, please subscribe to our channel and click the notification button to get notified when we drop other videos, like this one. Also, please share this video, as that helps to build our channel, and we really appreciate all of your support. Before the first white settlers arrived in the area of Rhode Island, the land was the home to the indigenous tribes of the Narragansett and the Wampanoag. The first white settlers to arrive in the area were a group of religious refugees who left Massachusetts. These refugees were no longer welcome in that colony. These refugees came to Aquidneck Island in 1639, and they were led by a group of eight men. These men included Nicholas Easton, William Coddington, John Clark, John Coggeshall, William Brenton, Jeremy Clark, Thomas Hazard, and Henry Bull. Their religious settlement began in Portsmouth, and the group was also led by Anne Hutchinson. Hutchinson had been a bit of a troublemaker in Massachusetts, especially among the Puritans of Boston. In 1636, she started the Free Grace Movement. This was a movement that preached the certainty of God's will. This particular idea went against the views of the Puritan Church's doctrine. The Church put Hutchinson on trial for being a usurper. She was tried and convicted for the crime of going against the Church's doctrine. While in prison and awaiting her punishment, she met and aligned with William Coddington. She was able to leave her confinement, and soon after followed Coddington and his new religious sect to Aquidneck Island. Shortly after, Anne Hutchinson separated from Coddington and his group, and moved with her own group of religious followers to New Netherland, or what eventually would become the New York and New Jersey colonies. Coddington and his group moved to the south of the island, and began the settlement of Newport. Over the next few years, more people came to the area, and soon Newport became the largest settlement on Aquidneck Island, which was now being called the Colony of Rhode Island. The name of Rhode Island came from the Dutch explorer Adrian Bloch. He called it Root Eilant, which meant Red Island. This was a reference to the red clay that lined the shore. The name was later anglicized when the colony came under British rule and it was then called Rhode Island. In 1640, John Clark started the first Baptist church in Newport. This was only the beginning of the colony welcoming those of different religious faiths, with Newport taking the lead on this distinction. In fact, Newport was the first American city to welcome the first group of Jews into the New World. By the 17th century, Jews were persecuted for their beliefs throughout the world. The Spanish Inquisition of the late 1400s expelled Sephardic Jews from Spain. These Jews moved first to Portugal and then to Brazil, but they did not have much acceptance in either country. No one wanted them there, and they were not welcome to stay. But despite this lack of support, these Sephardic Jews did manage though with some conflict and strife, to have a productive life in Brazil that lasted for several decades. Then in 1624, Holland captured Brazil from Portugal. This was good news for the Jews, as Holland was far more accepting of them and their culture. Because of this more open attitude, about 200 Jews began to move to the parts of Brazil that the Dutch took over. And during this time, many of these Jews started to work for the Dutch East India Company. They absolutely flourished under Dutch control. Then in 1658, Portugal retook the parts of Brazil that they had lost to the Dutch. This included the town of Recife, 
where most of the Brazilian Jews lived. Once the Portuguese took over, they began enforcing very harsh laws that were reminiscent of the time of the Spanish Inquisition. This forced many of the Jews of Brazil to flee, not wanting to be subjected by these new and terrible laws. They went first to Suriname, then to Barbados and Jamaica, before finally coming to Newport, Rhode Island. The first group of these Sephardic Jews only numbered around 15 people. In 1677, this fledgling Jewish community bought land for a Jewish cemetery, which is still in Newport and sits at K and Turo streets. Over the years, more Jews arrived in Newport and the Jewish community grew and flourished throughout the 18th century. The Jewish community also helped develop new industries in the town of Newport, which included the sperm oil and candle trade. Newport Jews also had businesses such as sugar refineries, rope works, and furniture factories. Because of their exponential growth, the Jewish community of Newport built the first synagogue in all of the American colonies. The construction of the synagogue started in 1759 and was finished in 1763. It was called the Turo Synagogue. The synagogue was named for their cantor, Isaac Turo. President George Washington even visited the synagogue in 1790. After his visit, Washington wrote a letter to the congregation that reflected on the subject of beliefs and pluralism. He sent the letter on August 21, 1790. His letter was immediately read to the congregation, and it has since become an annual tradition for the synagogue to read that same letter of Washington's every year on August 21st. In 1946, the Turo Synagogue was designated a historic site. It underwent a restoration in 2005 and 2006 and celebrated its 250th birthday in 2013. In 1663, the colony of Rhode Island received its royal charter. In 1741, the old colony house in Washington Square served as the first seat of the Rhode Island government, and it remained the state capital until 1904, when Providence then became the official state capital of Rhode Island. The first governor of Rhode Island was Benedict Arnold. He became governor in 1662. When Arnold served as governor, it was a time of much political upheaval in England and in the colonies. At this period of time, England had been ruled by Oliver Cromwell, but he had just recently died, and now King Charles II had ascended to the throne. This ascension caused much turmoil, and Governor Arnold found himself in the middle of that turmoil. Arnold also caused controversy when he accepted a sect of Quakers into Newport. Many of the citizens of Newport wanted to expel the Quakers. Arnold, himself, was not a fan of the Quakers, but he did believe that Newport was a place of tolerance for all religious beliefs and ideologies, and he felt strongly that they should stay. Arnold remained the governor of Rhode Island for 11 years. He had many famous descendants. One of Arnold's most famous descendants is his grandson and namesake, Benedict Arnold III, who was best known for his treasonous acts during the American Revolution. But other equally famous descendants included Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry, who was the hero of the Great Lakes during the War of 1812. Also Matthew Perry, Oliver's brother, who was the person that compelled the opening of Japan to the West with the Convention of Kanagawa in 1854. And there was also Stephen Douglas, who ran and lost to Abraham Lincoln and was best known for his debate of Lincoln in 1858. By the mid-19th century, Newport saw a new wave of Portuguese Jewish immigrants. It was this wave of Jews that started the sperm whale oil industry and helped make Newport one of the leading and most prominent whaling communities in the world. They built the oil and candle manufacturing trade, which soon gave Newport a monopoly in this trade. It remained this way until the American Revolution began. But the exponential growth of business in Newport and the colony of Rhode Island brought with it some unfortunate and painful conditions and episodes for those on the lower end of the scale of society. 
As the colony grew, the Rhode Island Assembly began to restrict the substance activities that were crucial to the survival of the native peoples. This included no longer allowing the native peoples to cut down trees to build their homes, and they were also prohibited from hunting deer. These restrictions brought tensions between the indigenous tribes and the white settlers, so much so that the tensions eventually broke out into war, and this was the King Philip's War of 1675. The King Philip's War permanently changed Rhode Island. In the battle, thousands of native peoples were killed, and those natives that survived the war either left the area or were sold into slavery. And during the colony's early days, Newport became the hub of the New England slave trade. At its height, enslaved people made up one-fifth of Newport's population. The city was deeply embedded in the triangle slave trade, as Newport was considered the rum capital of the world, having over 22 rum distilleries within the city. The distilleries were supplied with sugar and molasses from plantations in the Caribbean, and all of these plantations used slave labor to harvest those crops. Unfortunately, the various religious groups that were given safe harbor in Newport after they had escaped their own persecution, were among the merchants involved in the slave trade and prospered from it, as did a great many of the original white settlers of Newport. These Newport merchants also kept enslaved people, using them as their own labor force. Newport merchants documented over 934 slaving voyages to West Africa, which carried over 100,000 Africans to the West Indies and to America. There were many attempts by abolitionists to stop the slave trade in Newport. At first, these attempts were met with a lot of resistance. The triangle trade was far too profitable for a long time to consider stopping the abhorrent practice. It remained status quo for quite a while. It did stop for a short period during the Revolutionary War, but picked up again after the war concluded. Finally, in 1808, the slave trade was stopped after a federal law banned the nefarious commerce in all of Rhode Island. From then on, Rhode Island and the city of Newport were considered a free region. During the Revolutionary War, Newport saw a lot of action. In the winter of 1775 through 1776, the Rhode Island legislature put militia general William West in charge of purging loyalists to King George. Then in 1776, British forces invaded Newport and set the town up as a naval base for its ships. Their intention was to have a base to plan their attack on New York. The town of Newport was divided between pro-patriots and loyalist Tories. The pro-patriots left the city soon after the British took over, and many went to fight the British in various battles. The loyalists that remained behind supported the British soldiers. Newport remained in British hands for the next three years. In the summer of 1778, the Americans began the Battle of Rhode Island. This was the first joint campaign where American soldiers fought alongside French troops. This battle took place shortly after their alliance treaty. The French and American soldiers lost that battle. Then a year later, the British abandoned Newport to concentrate all of their efforts on New York. By 1780, Newport served as a base for French soldiers. The French stayed until 1781, when Rochambeau left Newport to help Washington's forces fight the decisive battle at Yorktown, Virginia, which finally ended the war. After the war, Newport lost much of its population. This was because the ongoing military occupation dried up Newport's economy during the war. Newport merchants moved out of the city and relocated to Providence, Boston, and New York. Newport struggled to return to its previous glory. In Newport, the Rhode Island General Assembly voted to ratify the Constitution in 1790. With most of the industry having departed Newport, the city became a sleepy seaport town. 
Though it was no longer the economic powerhouse it was before the Revolutionary War, it was still a city of stunning landscapes, lovely ocean breezes, and a mild climate. All of this made the town quite appealing. These factors appealed to mid-19th century southern plantation owners, looking for a place to escape the heat in the long summer months. The first summer cottage built by these southern families was a Gothic revival home designed by Richard Upton and was created for the George Noble Jones family in 1839. George Noble Jones owned a large cotton plantation in Florida. He chose a location for his fine summer cottage on Bellevue Avenue in Newport. Bellevue Avenue was a farm path that had an excellent location near the sea. Jones called his cottage, Kingscote. The home remained with the Jones family until the Civil War, when the Jones family permanently left Newport. It was then sold to Henry King in 1864. King was an old China trade merchant. King's nephew, David King, leased the cottage from his uncle in 1876. He started making alterations to the home to make it fit better among the newer and more lavish cottages that were being built in Newport. The Chateau sur Mer was the next large mansion to be built in Newport. It was built in 1852 for the William Shepherd Westmore family. Westmore also worked in the old china trade. Among the cottages built in Newport at the time, Chateau sur Mer was considered quite palatial and it became the location where many lavish and grand-scale parties were held each summer season. It remained the most magnificent mansion until the great Gilded Age industrialist Cornelius Vanderbilt built the Breakers Cottage at 44 Ochre Point Avenue in 1893. For the construction of the Breakers, Cornelius Vanderbilt commissioned famed New York architect Richard Morris Hunt to design and construct the home. Hunt was known as the architect that helped shape New York City. Some of Hunt's most famous buildings include the pedestal that is used for the Statue of Liberty, the entrance facade of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the New York Tribune Building. The Vanderbilts also used Hunt to design their estate in Asheville, North Carolina, the Biltmore Estate. Richard Morris Hunt designed many of the mansions in Newport. The Breakers Mansion was the epitome of the splendor of the Gilded Age cottages of that era. It is undoubtedly one of the largest and most opulent of the summer cottages of Newport. Newport soon became the summer playground for the wealthy industrialists of the Gilded Age. Industrialists like the Vanderbilts, the Astors, the Wideners, and anyone who was anyone in affluent society, came to Newport for the summer season during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. They would go to the best parties, visit among the elites of society, play tennis, go sailing, make business alliances and marriage matches, and be surrounded by prestige and money. At the same time, they would enjoy the mild New England air. These wealthy families brought a new panache to a community that had lost its prominence after the Revolutionary War. Author Edith Wharton described the lifestyle of Gilded Age Newport in her novel, The Age of Innocence. Wharton, herself, owned a cottage in Newport, which she called Land's End. Hammersmith Farm is a cottage built in 1887 for John Auchincloss. He was Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy's stepfather. Hammersmith Farm was where Jackie spent most of her childhood. It was also where she and her husband John F. Kennedy held their wedding reception. One of the best loved activities of the upper class Newport youths was bicycling. Bicycling was so popular in Newport that the city became the spot where 31 cycling clubs came to meet in May 1880. At this convention of bicyclists, they formed the League of American Wheelmen, which was the first national bicycling organization. Newport is also considered the sailing capital of the world. It was chosen as the new home of the National Sailing Hall of Fame, which moved from Annapolis, Maryland, to Newport in 2019. It was the site of the America's Cup sailing races from 1930 to 1983. 
it remains the starting point for the biannual 635 nautical mile Newport Bermuda race. Newport is also the home of the International Tennis Hall of Fame. The city hosts the Hall of Fame Tennis Championship game every July. Newport was the location for such famous and popular movies as High Society, made in 1956, The Great Gatsby, created in 1974, True Lies, Amistad, 27 Dresses, Mr. North, and Moonrise Kingdom. Some notable celebrities who at one time lived in Newport include the following. Mina Suvari, known for her roles in American Pie and American Beauty. Richard Hatch famous for being the first winner of the television show, Survivor. Charlie Day, popular actor from the television series, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Joanna Going, best known for her role in House of Cards. Nadia Bjorlin, actress on the daytime drama, Days of Our Lives. Alan Francis, actor in such movies as 13 Days and Meet the Parents. Betty Hutton, who is known for her roles in the movies Annie Get Your Gun and The Greatest Show on Earth. Van Johnson, MGM actor known for his roles in a wide variety of comedies and dramas throughout the 1940s and 1950s. First Lady, Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy Onassis. Heiress Doris Duke. Oracle founder, Larry Ellison. Talk show host, Jay Leno and Judge Judy Scheindlin. After World War II, Newport had one of the most successful historic preservation efforts in the country. The Newport Preservation Organization saved hundreds of structures throughout Newport County. This successful preservation movement helped to bring Newport out of economic decline and turned it into a city of heritage tourism. Visitors come every year to Newport to visit the Great Gilded Age Mansion, see the two Hall of Fame museums and the oldest synagogue, take in the exciting nightlife, go sailing on the pristine waters, and explore the many treasures Newport has to offer. If you are fortunate enough to find yourself in Rhode Island and the East Coast, you must make a stop in Newport and seize the opportunity to take in the beauty and the fascinating history of this magnificent city. You will marvel at how wonderful Newport really is. Thank you for watching this episode of the fascinating history and stories of our neighborhoods. We want to thank all of our wonderful subscribers and ask anyone who has not subscribed to our channel to please do so. Only with your support can you help us to grow and to provide you with more videos like this one. Also, if you have an idea or want us to present your neighborhood in one of our future videos, please send us an email to the email shown here and tell us a little bit about your neighborhood and what makes it so fascinating and special. If we use your idea in a future video, you will get a huge shout out and thank you from us. Please, look for our other videos on our channel and please stay tuned for new videos to come your way shortly. Thanks again for watching.